Hello everyone, my name is Meredith Jaffe and on behalf of the Newcastle Writers Festival, welcome to our conversation, War Wounds. Before I introduce our guests, I'd like to take this opportunity to say that even though we are in virtual festival format, we would love everyone to share us on their socials. Um, if you would like to do that uh, on whatever your favourite favorite platform might be, the hashtag is NWF stories to you. And because we're still dealing in this world of wonderful technology, you will find at the end of this session a link to McLean Booksellers where you can buy both of today's guest books. And even better, if you would like to support Newcastle Writers Festival in this experimental format, you can press the donate link to the website and donate to the festival. Now, let me begin with the introductions. Fable Parrot's career was launched with her critically acclaimed debut, Past the Shallows, which sold internationally, was shortlisted for the prestigious Lyle Franklin Award, uh, won the Dobby Literary Award, and is now taught in high schools across the country. Her next novel, When the Night Comes, was also critically acclaimed, and it's been a long-awaited and much-enjoyed third novel, There Was Still Love, that we're celebrating today. It has recently won the 2020 Indies, Indie Book Awards Book of the Year Award and the Fiction Book of the Year Award. It is also currently shortlisted for the Stella Prize, which will be announced next week. So who knows? This could be a precursor to Sable's big win or somebody. Who knows? And it's also been long listed for the ABIA Best Literary Fiction Book. Suzanne Leal is the author of Border Street and the 2017 bestseller, The Teacher's Secret. She is a regular interviewer and facilitator at literary events and festivals. She was also the senior judge for the New South Wales Premier's Literary Award from 2017 to 2019. Suzanne's other job is as a lawyer, where her experience includes child protection, criminal law and refugee law. Her new novel, The Deceptions, was officially launched on Thursday night by the time this goes to air. Not live, sadly, but virtually, making her at the vanguard of a new world of publishing. Welcome, Favelle and Suzanne. Thank you Thank so you much. Meredith. <laughs> Thank you, Meredith. Wonderful to be here. Delightful to see you. So, Favelle, I believe the inspiration for There Was Still Love came in the form of a gherkin jar. Can you tell us about this personal connection to the story? Yeah, it did. Sometimes stories find you in the strangest ways. I was in an awful shopping mall called Northland, somewhere I hate to go. I couldn't find the exit to the car park and instead I found this European deli that I have never seen before. Something made me go inside and there in front of my eyes were some Czechoslovakian gherkins that I haven't tasted since I was 16. So I bought all of them. There were about eight jars, dusty. Mm. God knows how long they had been there. But I did find the exit. I found my car and I opened up a jar. They were warm but still the taste, the smell, made me burst into tears instantly and I was suddenly a small child back in this art deco flat with my grandma and my grandpa and there was this ritual with lunch that we'd each have a gherkin on the side of our plate with our roll and I just wanted to be with them again to drive to the flat for them to be there um, but they passed a long time ago so instead I went to the cemetery where they're buried and I sat with them and I said, okay, I know nothing about your lives before me, so now I want to know everything. And that's how the story began that day. That's just beautiful. Suzanne, The Deceptions, which is beautiful cover, by the way, of both these books, The Deception also has a personal connection for you, although in quite a different way. Where did the idea for the deceptions come from? It's really wonderful to be here today and really wonderful to be sharing the stage with Fable, this book I love. And um, coincidentally, my book also takes us back to Czechoslovakia and also to wartime Czechoslovakia, although, of course, Fable's book is slightly later. Um, the inspiration for the deceptions came from my former landlord. Fred and Eva Perger. So years ago out of uni, uh, I was looking for a flat. Uh, I wanted to live beachside in Sydney, 
an advertisement came up for Tamarama, which is fantastic. Drawback was we'd have to live near the landlord. I thought, doesn't matter. We'll get the beach. The landlords um, were Fred and Eva Perger, Czech and Jewish and Holocaust survivors, and people who became like sort of parents or sort of grandparents to me. Uh, we lived there for six years, and Fred and I came particularly close. And after some years, he offered to tell me his story. If I asked him to tell me his wartime story, which he hadn't really told in depth. I think a lot of Holocaust survivors find it very difficult. And because I, I wasn't actually a daughter, wasn't actually a granddaughter, I think sometimes that made it easier. Anyway, so we sat down for a year. Uh, I we recorded his story. I transcribed it. It formed the basis, really, for my first novel, Border Street. And but there was one story that he told me that never quite left me. And um, can I just tell you briefly what that story was? Please. Thank you. Thank you. So um, Fred and Eva had been teenagers when the war started and they were taken to a, a ghetto called Theresienstadt, which was outside Prague. Um, that ghetto was guarded, yes, by the SS, but also by Czech gendarmes, who were part military, part police. One gendarme became friendly with Fred and Eva, and particularly with Eva's father, who was a doctor. The gendarme had broken his arm. Eva's father, uh, as a doctor, as a surgeon, had set it for him. In return, he'd agreed to uh, smuggle in letters, smuggle in parcels in and out of the ghetto. Otherwise, they would have been censored. That was great. The problem was the gendarme was having an illicit relationship with one of the Jewish women who was in the camp. That was illegal. Um, that was what was called Russian shunda or race shame and was very heavily penalised. It was discovered. Uh, the gendarme was arrested, uh, as was the young woman. And when he was arrested, the gendarme's notebook was taken as well. In that notebook were um, the details of Eva's father. He was then also taken to the to political prisoners prison outside of Theresian start and Fred and Eva lost the protection they'd had uh, and from there they were sent east to our ship. Uh, they survived, but um, after a very harrowing time. Yep, there's more to that story, there's more that I can't tell you because it basically forms the crux of my new novel, The Deception. What I wanted to know is what happened to that woman? I mean, the woman who had been in a relationship with a Czech gendarme. Why was she in the relationship? What sort of relationship was it? What had happened to her? And what are the ramifications for all that down the line? Couldn't find any research. I didn't have her name. I had very little to go by. So I um, I thought I'll write a novel, um, a novel that I've, I've tried to heavily research, but a novel to try and discover what might have happened to this woman. Excellent. Um, Fable, your story is predominantly written from the perspective of a child, from ch children's perspective. And what did that, I was wondering as a, as a one writer to another, I suppose, as well as a curious reader, what did that allow you to do with the novel that you would not, perhaps would have felt more constrained by if you tried to tell it from an adult perspective? Well, I have to be a, a child again, and these two children, Lujek and Malalishka, which means little fox, are really looking at these adults and trying to work out what's happening all the time. So there's some big things happening in this novel that through a child's perspective they're trying to work it out just by the adults' um, reactions. So I think we forget that children can pick up on energies they might not understand the conversation 100 percent, but they know that there's something interesting here or something frightening or something amazing is happening and um I love that because it it's it's a hard way to write because it, it, there's a lot of gaps so you're sort of looking through a lattice in a way um but I love that too because it leaves all this space for the reader to be in the novel too um I'm kind of fascinated with the child perspective looking at the adult world. And it's particularly interesting in this case because the relationship with the child, both the children in the novel is, with, is not with the parent but with the grandparent as well, isn't it? Yeah, so here's these 
especially these two women, these two sisters who are twins and one is stuck in Prague and the other is stuck in Melbourne and um, they're both looking after grandkids. So to these grandkids, they are these giant atlases that are holding up the sky and keeping these two children safe at great cost to themselves. Mm. So they're the heroines of this novel. That's what I wanted people to see them as. Mm. You know, no one will, yeah. No, and, in, and succeed brilliantly. I love them. We're going to talk a little bit more about them later. Suzanne, when, like the teacher's secret, the deceptions is told through multiple lenses. And I, I wondered if this is the way your inner lawyer allows you, is about allowing everyone on the page the opportunity to witness the story as it were. Is that is that kind of where you're coming from to, all, to be so drawn to the, the multiple characters or is it just because you like to make the writing as difficult as possible for yourself? Oh, you know, Meredith, I just like to make things as difficult as humanly <laughs> possible for myself. <laughs> There's an interesting point about the lawyer. Uh, I hadn't thought of that. So, so what I do as a lawyer, um, for those up there that don't know me, is that um, I used to practice um, in criminal law and then I then I went into tribunal. So I was a member of the Refugee Review Tribunal and I'm now in a state-based tribunal where I look at whether people should be working with children, guardianship issues, whether they should have a gun, a whole lot of issues as to what uh, should happen. And you're right, Meredith, um, people come before me. I have witnesses, I have an applicant, I have uh, paperwork, and I have to make a decision on the material I've got. So it, there's not ever one truth. There is a, a whole lot of versions of a story that I'm paid to make sense of. And, and perhaps that's why I've, in the last two books at least, I've um, I've taken different voices because in the, in the Teacher's Secret, it was a story of a community and a community is made of many people. And so the voices seemed almost like a choir uh, to be wrapped up at the end. In the new book, in the Deception, it's a story of this unknown uh, Jewish woman called, that I've called Hannah. It's the story of the Czech gendarme in his old age called Carl. It's the story of his granddaughter who's navigating a difficult affair with her boss. And it's the story of Reverend Ruth Martin, who is the minister who ministers to Carl's wife. I thought they each had a place in the narrative and I wanted them to be heard. And the book is called The Deceptions for a reason. It's called The Deceptions because... Everybody has a secret. Everybody is holding something and everybody is either deceiving themselves or somebody else. And I thought the best way to show that was through these different perspectives to bring the reader with me and only to have it revealed to the end when you understand what people's role is in the overarching story. Mm. The other thing that I loved about, um, and neither of your books are particularly big books, but one of the things that I loved about your writing, Fable, is how you captured so much flavour in the story about growing up mm. in Czechoslovakia in the 1980s. Um, and I'm just absolutely curious as to how you got to that level of detail, because we know that you didn't grow up in Czechoslovakia mm. in the 1980s. So how did you do it? What, what were your sources? Well, that was the hardest part for me because I was writing about my grandparents first and suddenly I had this young boy who just runs through Prague and is alive and um, ecstatic and he thinks he's invisible and he was um, such an um, energetic character. I, lo I loved him but I thought, how can I write this story because I haven't um, experienced what it's like to grow up in communist Prague. Um, I don't feel like I have the authority to do this. And just out of the blue, this is one of those amazing lucky things. Um, my cousin, who I haven't spoken to for 25 years, he found me on Facebook. And so he grew up with his grandma, who is my grandma's sister, in Prague. And I told him what I was doing and he immediately wanted to be a part of it. He said, I just want to be back in that flat with my grandma, with my bubby. So ask me questions. So every day we would chat on Facebook um, Messenger 
and I would just ask him a million questions. What did you have for lunch at school? What would you do if you found 20 cents? What did you do on the weekend? What did you eat for breakfast, lunch, dinner? Like I drove him mad and he told me a little story. So then I got this nod from him that I had permission to write this story and get it right. And he was hard on me when he was the first reader and he was extremely angry with me over um, I had a scene where they were eating chicken sitchels and potato dumplings and he went crazy and he said, Favour, have you had a head injury? Czech people do not eat chicken sitchel with potato dumplings. How could you forget this? <laughs> so um, he was great. And then he said that, He'd been crying for three days after reading it. So then I knew, even though I hadn't lived it, I got something right, some emotional truth right, and then I felt good about it. And you say that you couldn't ask your grandparents about the story because obviously they were no longer part of your living life. But apart from Martin, your cousin, where else did you did you draw on your memories to, to create both Little Fox's point of view but also Luke's point of view? I, I drew on all of my memories, my brother's memories, my other cousins. Um, my, my Obviously my parents as well helped a little bit but it was the past that we didn't know about. I, I still don't know why my grandma left Prague just before the war, why she was forced to leave and why her sister was forced to stay and I'll never know. I had to kind of make it up. I even hired a genealogist in Prague who tried to work on this and um, we just don't know. Mm. So I made it up but there are there is a sort of truth to what I made up in that there's stories, there's family stories that maybe this is the truth. I now feel like this book literally is my family history even though I made it up so it's a strange thing I feel like oh this all really happened it feels like that when you read it too like it it has that kind of veracity in the narrative that you sit there going she's so just got copied out all the family stories from a journal and just popped it in literally none yeah so I'm, I'm just um what I've made up now is sort of filled in the blanks about my grandparents' lives. So I feel like I know them better, even though I made it up. (laughs) They have, you know, there's this, I can see them as children. I can see them falling in love. I can see them in London in 1940. So it was great to to be able to zoom back in time and and make up their story. Hmm. Suzanne, you obviously had a very different experience. As you've already explained, this wasn't your story. It wasn't your family's story. Um, You don't have any connection to Czechoslovakia at any point in time. And it's obviously an historical novel to some extent, given that these events, um, so in Fagel's case, they happened sort of more in Stalinist Czechoslovakia rather than the war, although the war was the catalyst. In your story, very much, uh, you know, the largest chunk of the story is in this terrible ghetto in Prague and the events that follow from that. How how did you go about the research? What was important to you in researching the deceptions? I think, uh, as Fable said, what's really important with researching, particularly for a novel, is those day-to-day things. What do you eat? Um, Where In in the ghetto, what was was the sanitation like? Uh, What did you wear? How did you spend your day? And um, from the tomes that are written historically, that's often difficult to find. So where I found a lot of information was in the memoirs uh, of people who had lived through the war, particularly during the Holocaust, that's my interest. I also um, can't um, thank Steven Spielberg enough for his initiative, the Shoah initiative, in which he recorded the, um, the, the testimonies of all the Holocaust survivors who were still alive. So Fred and Eva each took part in that uh, initiative. And it was, you know, it, it was like, I can't remember what year it was, years ago when they're still using videos. And Fred invited me in to watch his interview. And it was sort of, it was sort of like being invited into his mind. And it was such a privilege. I didn't know what to bring with me. I didn't know how to behave. Eva couldn't stay to watch her own. It was too difficult but she let me watch it. So I felt as though I'd been given a story that 
or at least I've had a story shared with me that I had to be very, very careful with because there was so much anguish involved in it. The, um, the videos were very useful uh, in terms of trying to understand the depth of the despair and the depth of the horror. When I made my character, Hannah, uh, she is in no way based upon my old neighbour and landlady, Eva Perger. But what I did use was I had her geographical journey replicate what had happened to Eva. So where Hannah goes, Eva went. And I knew about that because Eva had told me it. Uh, there are other people who have written memoirs uh, along the same line with the same journey, the same trajectory, the same horror, including Azadenka Santlova, who is a, who, who authored the Tin Ring, who still lives in London. And there's also a, a tone called Theresian Scout that was written by H.G. Adler, who himself was in the ghetto. He wrote it in German. I speak German, I read German, but it's um, a pretty, pretty difficult language. <laughs> it's pretty hard to read. So I, I knew that there was a trans English translation in the works, and I was just waiting and waiting <laughs> for this book to be translated. Finally, it was. So I've, I've bought this. Thank you very much, Ms. Cooper, for translating it. So it's about <laughs> a thousand pages, and, and that you know it's, it's very academic, um, but it it gives me the information. And just quickly, I'm also really indebted to Bram Presser, um, a Victorian writer, also of Czech background and Leah Kaminsky, who's um, Australian, Jewish and Polish origin, for having been my first readers for the book. And like Fable said, having um, picked out the stuff that I wouldn't have realised was wrong, like yeah. like the dumplings, uh, just picked up the point. So that, that was my research. I forgot to say, Fable, why are dumplings wrong with chicken schnitzel? Well, <laughs> well um Yes, so in if you in Germany you you could have uh, chicken schnitzel with dumplings, but in um, uh, in Czechoslovakia no. So I I had forgotten this. You have potato salad or fried potatoes. Mm. It's very important. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> and and I really liked the way that you did use food in the novel, and and, and that was an, a classic moment where I felt that you were recollecting childhood memories of beautiful cooking because it seems that both your nana, well, sorry, you're not that you call her nana, but your nana and and uh, the character and the characters nana, Ludwig's nana, um, well, actually not Ludwig's nana, Little Fox's nana, were brilliant cooks. So yeah, that was definitely had that sort of oral sense to the narrative as it were. <laughs> yeah, she was a great cook and I don't know if you've ever had Czech food. It's um very unhealthy. <laughs> it's delicious. It's um there's lots of fried in butter schnitzels. Salad might be a cucumber sliced and put in cream. <laughs> so it's all Delicious dessert is um, fruit dumplings, so like apricot or plum dumplings steamed and then covered in cottage cheese, melted butter and sugar. So it's all fruit to put fat on your bones and, um, oh, delicious. Um, but, yeah, not that healthy. <laughs> Good, okay when you're seven, not so great when you're 17. Yeah, I know, I love it. <laughs> um, if there was still love, part of the narrative tension is tied up in the fact that uh, we have one sister who was forced to stay in Prague and another who was forced to leave. Whereas in The Deceptions, both of the main characters are forced to leave their homes and build life in another country. And it, it struck me as I was sort of thinking about today's session that it seems that the physical distance in these novels mirrors the emotional distance. And, and then I started to think, well, how important is geography to these stories and to your telling of them? And you can take turns to answer that. <laughs> well, one thing that is fascinating to me about uh, my grandma is um, she lived outside of um, Prague um, after 16 years old, but her whole life she recreated Prague in her home. So inside that flat was Prague. Um, she spoke Czech, she ate Czech food, cooked Czech food. There was tapestries of Prague. There were Czech knickknacks. Everything was Prague. Um, 
So it's like a, a lot of migrants, you play that game of outside, you, you, you try and assimilate, but at home you just want to be Czech, you just want to be you. Um, her and her sister lived in the same flat. I was lucky enough to visit her sister in 1993. My grandma had passed away. She was still in Prague. I visited her flat and her flat was so the same as my grandma. Firstly, I burst into tears, but everything was the same. They lived in the same flat in two different cities. It, it blew me away. They never really left each other. And maybe you never really leave home in your heart or soul. You know, as my grandmother got older and sicker when she was um, close to death, she just reverted completely to Czech. She lost all of her English. And I took that as her going home already. Her soul was going home. Um, yeah. And, and Suzanne, how did you find that? In, because it's, a, it's a, in a very different way in your novel. But the, this sense of geography is critical, isn't it? Yes, the, the, the novel is in two timelines, really. It's contemporary Sydney, contemporary Australia and wartime Europe. And in each of those timelines, the geography is very important. Um, clearly for the war, I had to be very careful. And Hanna, I won't spoil it too much, but Hanna's trip in the war takes her beyond the ghetto into much more difficult places even than the ghetto. And I think when you're writing about the Holocaust, I think particularly when you're not Jewish, you have a an imperative to be very careful and to be as accurate as you possibly can and as sensitive as you possibly can. That meant I had to get the geography right. I had to get the nature of the ghetto right. I had to get the dates of the transports right. I had to get how the transport took place right. Uh, if I was talking about when they were, were walking and um, I needed to know how long that was. I needed to know what the conditions were like. I needed to understand that this was not a time of romance. This was a time of absolute horror and I needed to know that. Um, having said that, this is a novel and I don't want to mire my readers, particularly at the moment, in despair I want to write something that even when it's about difficult times is uplifting to stores of hope or resilience. And so in using the geography as my background, I built one up with friendship. So what I wanted to show was how friendship and support and love can even be found within those difficult times. Uh, so I suppose the geography for the wartime was very much the background in order to have a story that I, I hope is more uplifting. In terms of Sydney and the contemporary narrative, uh, I'm interested in what Fable said about her grandparents having recreated Prague in Sydney. And I'll go to the I'll go to the real people now, to Fred and Eva. They too, their their duplex was also Prague in Sydney, but Fred didn't want to be Czech in Sydney. He wanted absolutely not to be Czech. I mean, he had been an outsider for so long. He had been, he had loved uh, being in Prague until the Germans told him he was Jewish. It was something he'd never thought of himself, but mm -hmm. that's how he was labelled. And then he loved Prague um, to come back to until the communists told him that he was a, um, a bourgeois and because his parents owned a factory and then he was an outsider again. So when they came to Sydney in 1968, they didn't want to be outsiders. So Fred would be so annoyed with Eva if she'd try and speak Czech anywhere, anywhere except inside the house. Even at the clothesline sometimes, I would hear it because, you know, we're sharing this house and we shared a clothesline. And I'd hear them in Czech. I love the sound of it. I'd just listen. I'd try to go really quietly as I go up to the clothesline. And then Fred would say, Emma, Emma, no. <laughs> and suddenly they'd change to English. So I think... Um, there is love of home and there is love of, of, of being part of the new home. And I think that was the tension uh, for Fred and Eva and also the tension of my character, Carl, who is not Jewish and is not Fred, but who has that same tension. Mm. I also found it really interesting and there was still love, the argument over 
that, that the sisters have over who had it worse. It's a sort of, it's an overt part of the story um, that you slowly reveal as the novel, you know. I mean, obviously there is that, that the tension that you have because one sister lives in Melbourne in, in not very good circumstances by Australian circum, uh, by Australian standards, but when she goes to visit her sister, her twin sister in Prague, they, they're wealthy by comparison. There's, I'm not talking about that particular aspect, but rather, who had it worse in is as the overt storyline of your novel. Whereas, see, with the deceptions, the argument is buried in the heart of the story about who has it worse, and it's really left to the reader to ask that question. And I'm just wondering. I guess as writers, you know, Fable for you first is what, why you structured your novel that way to make this overt question about who had it worse as part of the character's narrative and not about a part of your underlying storyline. Yeah, it's probably the big question of the novel, who had it worse, and it was the big question between my grandma and her sister. They loved each other terribly. My grandma would save for three or four years just to get back to Prague, they'd save all their coins. Like it meant everything to go home to see her. And, um, you know, that's what she lived for. But they would niggle with each other. You know, one learnt to cook because she was sent to London and had to be a maid. That's my grandma. So the other one would say, well, no one ever taught me how to cook. We had nothing to cook during the war. Um, They would niggle at each other. And I didn't really understand what was happening uh, and so I was trying to work that out in this book who had it worse the one that gets stuck at home is free to speak her language and understands her culture but has an oppressive uh, communist regime to deal with and he's stuck and can't travel or the one who he's banished from home and cannot return but has freedom but doesn't feel at home in her new country, you know, is, mm-hmm. is called a wog in the market, feels uncomfortable with her cheekbones, her accent, her height, always. So who had it worse? And I came to the conclusion in the, in the end, both of them, it's just bloody sad that they missed out on all of those years together, that all of these people in Europe lives were destroyed by the big history, everyday people. It's just sad. Um, Mm. And people did their best. Both of them did their best um, and sheltered their grandkids and were beautiful people. But, yeah, it's um, I have them together at the end sort of forgiving each other and I I remember that this did happen. They both knew it was the last time they'd see each other. They were getting older. My grandma didn't have as much money because my granddad had lost his job and it was this sort of saying goodbye and I forgive you um, sort of time, yeah. Wrenching though, totally wrenching. See, with with your book, Suzanne, um, the title of the book obviously doesn't just come from the wartime betrayals that happen to our characters. Um, I just, I guess I'd like you to expand a little bit about, about you know, the, the resolution for your characters comes in a sort of a heart, heart in mouth moment at the, at the end of the book. But I just kind of was interested in your character's journey to that point in time um, where they are exposed for their deceptions and uh, it's just emotionally fraught, isn't it? Yeah, look, I think what I been interested in is is truth, what the nature of truth is, um, what lies encompass. Are they good lies? Are lies always bad? Is deception always bad? Is deception sometimes the only the only way to go? Um, look, perhaps this comes from my career, perhaps this comes from being a lawyer. Um, I'm I think of myself as a story lawyer rather than a puzzle lawyer. There's sort of um, intricate work like tax law, which is very puzzle like and the work that I have, I like because it's a story. So I have people who come to me with their story and they want something from me. Um, they want a particular licence or a particular right to do something. So in the case of refugees, um, they want to gain asylum. And not all these people have behaved 
honourably, not all these people have behaved honestly, not all these people have behaved well. But surely um, in the end I think there is a concentrate of goodness in most people where generally people try to do the right thing even if they do completely the wrong thing. So what I look at is decisions that people who you might argue are essentially good people make poor decisions they make, criminal decisions in some cases. But um, where is forgiveness in that? Where is resilience and where is the right way forward? I don't think it's a question I necessarily answer, but I I do think I've always grappled with the nature of truth and the nature of right and wrong. Mm -hmm. Resilience is a really key point because I think it's the common theme for both of your novels is this uh, you know resilience is at the heart of this and how those characters are forged by the suffering and the loss but ultimately love and that's one of the wonderful things about your novel fable is it is aptly titled there was still love and it absolutely is true but is that is that the conclusion you also reach that through all the suffering through all the hardships, through all the, as Suzanne just said, circumstances way beyond people's control, you know, world events, that that if love is an overriding win in these circumstances. Absolutely. Um, when I think of my grandparents, um, they're the two people that taught me about love and about kindness. They didn't have a lot of money. They never owned a house. There wasn't McDonald's or movies or outings, but there was time and love and that's the gift that they gave me Um, and what an amazing gift from people who had been through so much. They were able to still love and still um, be kind. Mm. Yeah. We're going to have to wrap it up there, my my dear friends. I'm just going to, uh, I can't even go to the audience for questions, sadly. But I would <laughs> like to ask our virtual audience to please thank our two guests. I'm just going to pop your books up here. Our two guests, Fable Parrot, There Was to Love, and Suzanne Leal, The Deception. Both of these books you can buy from McLean's Bookstore if you follow the links at the end of this session. Don't forget you can also donate if you would like to. And I would like to thank you, and I'm sure Susanna Faber will join me here, to thank our virtual audience for coming and joining us here today. And if you were here, I would do this, and I'm still going to do this. I'm just going to fairy clap it so it doesn't make too much noise and hurt your ears. Um, And we look forward to seeing you at other sessions for the Newcastle Writers' Festival. Thank you, Fable, and thank you, Suzanne. Thank you so much. Thank you, Meredith. Brilliant. Thank you.